I saw this post recently and it blew my mind. It's a thought that I've had, but not one that I've articulated. And this post just really summed it all up. Your creations should have a longer lifespan than the 12-ish hours Instagram allows it on the feed. Repost and reshare your art. Don't be zucker fucked into thinking your creations are only valuable when they're new. We want to witness you over and over again. Isn't that lovely? And it got me thinking about how the internet can, yeah, help our creativity, but how it also kills it. And that's what I want to talk about today. How the internet kills your creativity. I'll split this video up into four parts. The definitions, the context, how it's killing your creativity, and what to do about it. And just before I do start, I totally get the irony that I'm making this on the internet. So, you know, it's not much we can do to get around that other than acknowledge it. Aren't we clever? Let's begin. Part one. Definitions. So firstly, we will define creativity. I define this in a couple of ways. It can be your ability to laterally solve problems or your ability to connect ideas that haven't yet been connected or the clarity with which you can tap into what you truly wanna make and also your ability to execute on these things. Secondly, I'll define the internet. I'm mostly talking about social media, but occasionally I do talk about the wider internet. And thirdly, kills, the relationship between these two things. It's a bit of a hyperbolic word, but what I'm really referring to is the idea that something could make something worse. There are definitely ways that the internet makes your creativity better, but there are also ways where it doesn't, and I'm talking about that. Part two, the context. We all know the internet story. A fringe piece of technology goes mainstream in the 90s. In the mid-thousands, social media sites start their rise to popularity. In the mid-tens, social media is pretty much the face of the internet. This is important because instead of you looking at the internet, now you are also creating the internet that other people are looking at. It's no longer an anonymous experience. You now have skin in the game. Which brings us to present day. 2021 internet. I'd argue that at this point, the internet is now a second reality. We have the real world and the internet. And now what we're seeing is people sacrificing things in the real world in order to serve the internet. What this might look like is people doing death defying stunts to get views, or people spending all their money on a hired Lamborghini to look rich, or people not making the things that they truly wanna make in order to please online strangers and some algorithm. If you resonate with that third group of people, then you are watching the right video. Part three, what does creativity killing look like? In my experience, I've noticed the internet killing creativity in about 10 ways. I'll take you through them. One, pleasing the algorithm. This is the idea that you would make something in order to hijack an algorithm, you know, pleasing our robot gods. What this might look like is when you're making something, but then you stop because it won't go well. Two, pleasing followers. This is pretty similar to pleasing an algorithm, the whole it won't go well thing, but the main difference is that we are equating popularity to our work's value. Popularity is a metric for value, but it's not the defining metric for value. You can see this in television shows, like if I look at Love Island, a popular show, with an unpopular show, Nirvana the Band the show, without throwing any shade on reality TV, I also appreciate it. I know that I'm gonna watch this one every time. Three. The consistency pressure. This is the idea that if you haven't posted in a week or two, you're somehow irrelevant. What this might look like is you churning out work that you don't fully believe in or work when you're tired because, you know, I need to. I haven't posted in a while or something like that. Four, the pressure to grow an audience. This is a really weird one. It's the idea that if you are creative, you should somehow want an audience online. It's so fine if you want to write TV shows or design board games or make products without wanting people to know who you are, without wanting to be vulnerable and intimate with a bunch of strangers. They're very, very different things, but somehow there is this expectation that if you are creative, you automatically should want an audience. And I think that's weird and we should question it more. Having an audience isn't everything. It might be your strategy, but it doesn't have to be your strategy. I think that's a very important distinction. Five, that negative metrics mean negative creativity. It's pretty easy if a post doesn't go well or if you lose followers to assume that you've done something wrong, but correlation doesn't always mean causation. Sometimes does, but what I've found to be more true is that your creativity often grows regardless of whether your social media does. Six, jealousy. Jealousy has been around for a long time. I mean, it's one of the commandments, but because it is triggered by exposure, social media has amplified jealousy to a new height. As all this data bombards our head every single day, we're gonna see people who are doing the things that we wish we could be doing, or things that we have the potential to do but aren't, getting rewards that we want but aren't. Naturally, this leads to jealousy, which can be helpful, but often just stops you in your tracks. Seven, the pressure to turn your creativity into a career. This is more of a cultural phenomenon, but it's very much in the language of social media. You might have experienced it if you've ever made like cupcakes for your friends and you give them all a cupcake and they take a bite and they're like, wow, this is really good. And then their next compliment is something like, you should start a bakery. The things we do for fun don't need to become productive. They don't need to all make money. Basically, your hobbies don't need to be your jobbies. Eight. Hijacking your thoughts. This is more of an abstract one, but when your brain is full of trends and comments and other stuff that you've seen online, it can be pretty hard to have like a clear thought. What this might look like is you thinking about the internet when you're not using it, which I am deeply guilty of. Nine, 
Cynicism. Oh god, we've all been there when we're scrolling for three hours and getting progressively more and more depressed and then you just look up from your phone and you're like, ugh. You throw your phone to the other side of the room and you're like, everything sucks. I hate it all. I hate it all. That feeling. And 10. Hijacking your time. This final one feels really obvious, but it definitely bears a mention. Using your phone means that you don't do other things. More time scrolling is less time painting. I've got this printout on my wall that shows me what daily screen time looks like in the long run. Four hours a day is two months of a year, which if you live to 84 is 14 years of your life scrolling. 14 years. It's a lot of years, man. So those are the main ways that I see the internet having a negative impact on creativity. But this leaves us with the obvious question, what do you do about it? Part four, what to do about it. Here's the part in the video where I tell you to quit social media forever and you never have any of these problems again, right? Wrong. This is the part in the video where I take you through ways that I have been using the internet, the stuff that works for me. It might not work for you and that's fine. There are five things I do. One, recognize all the ways that the internet grows your creativity. Sure, the internet kills our creativity, but there are ways that it massively grows it. There's a redistribution of power. In the broadcast model, you had a handful of executives decide who'd be successful and who wouldn't. Now with the internet, the market decides. If you're good, you're good. And what this leads to is a much truer representation of what the world actually looks like, not just the opinions of some gatekeepers. Similarly, it provides free or almost free education to people who'd otherwise not be able to afford it. The internet can inspire you. Sometimes you hit a home run, you know, you log on, you see something that makes you just really happy. And that's cool. The internet can create communities. For example, this one, I really love the community that is being built here. I love anybody who comments, watches, or subscribes to this channel. It is, ah, oh, it's beautiful and positive and it's been one of the best changes in my life, so thank you. And you can build a career on it if you want to. You don't have to want to, for the record, but I like that in a way it creates a lot of new opportunities. Two, use the internet right. This is what I do. Firstly, I curate my feed. If something doesn't make me happy, I mute it. If I want to find things that won't make me happy, I will actively seek them out, but I won't let them pop up incidentally. Personally, I delete TikTok and Instagram unless I'm posting, and I try not to use social media before 9 a.m. or after 9 p.m. And on a good day, that window will shrink, and on a bad day, it'll get completely abandoned. I try allocate time to scrolling and not scrolling. So on Saturdays, I try to take like as much time off as possible. I'll let my brain reset and think and dream and you know, be positive again. But on Sunday Arvos, I'll just scroll. I'll just check stuff out. And it's really nice. It's kind of like the idea behind a cheat meal. You know, you can abstain from the burger because you know you're looking forward to one. Three, I use the one for me, one for them rule. There's this John Mayer interview wherein a journalist asked him, when you write an album, how many of those songs are for you and how many of them are for people who listen? And he said, I write one for me and one for them. It was 50-50 and I really like this approach. What I like about it is it acknowledges the reality of wanting to grow an audience. It would be really easy to say, oh, just tap into what you truly want to make and just make that all the time without a single thought as to branding, growth, or building a creative career. But the reality is we do need to kind of play the game a little bit. And one for me, one for them is the perfect rule for me to play it with. It stops me worrying about metrics because I know that I'm hitting them and it stops me worrying about my creativity becoming all crowd-pleasing commercial stuff because I know I'm hitting that as well. In short, I think it's a pretty realistic approach to using the internet as a creative. Four, take the pressure off metrics. This is so much easier said than done and I wish I was one of those people who's like, oh, I just don't care about likes, man. But I do, I do care about them. I care about them so much and I'm a little bit ashamed of that. The idea here is that we don't fight our desire for likes and views, we just define what enough is. This way we stop constantly chasing. So for me, it helps to kind of set the bar not too high. For example, I need one in 10 videos to get one of the following metrics. 50K views, 10 positive comments, or one super positive comment saying something like, this is the best video you've ever made, or you've changed my mindset. So if one video in 10 gets like a super positive comment, then I know I'm doing something right. Five, be the change that you wish to see on the internet. Sorry for bastardizing that Gandhi quote there, but I felt like the wording just kind of worked. When I saw that post that we started the video with, the one with the girl with the sign, I just felt relief. I don't know, I felt good. It was one of those rare moments where the internet kind of gives you a bit of compassion and says, keep going, you're doing good, we love you. And I was like, wow. The same tool that's made me scared and self-conscious and jealous has also made me really happy. And it made me want to make a video that carries that feeling forward. So that's what, that's what this is. Hopefully. I don't know, is it working? Basically, the internet I want is one that treats people as people, not as means to an end, not as data to be sold, not as constant marketers and branders and creatives that are stressed out trying to fight some gigantic tech algorithm that doesn't even care about them. I guess what I'm saying is we can all see the potential and how good the internet can be, but it's up to us to actually make it. Thanks so much for watching. Thanks for sticking to the end. Hope you got a lot out of that. One cool little announcement. 
My book is now available for pre-order. This is my first copy that I just got. This is what it looks like. It's called Your Head is a Houseboat, A Chaotic Guide to Mental Clarity. So I'll leave some links in the description if you want, I don't know, this feeling, but offline. Massive thank you, like serious thank you to everybody who has pre-ordered so far. I seriously cannot thank you enough. If you're new here, please do subscribe. I make videos like this every week. And other than that, have a gorgeous day. Catch ya. Ooh.